Previously on the West Indies at War Racism continues to stand in the way of the establishment of a West Indies regiment. However, with thousands of men dying on the front lines every day, King George V has finally accepted the need to allow all men, regardless of race or class, to enlist. But around the world, enthusiasm for the war is waning and at home, life for the average man is getting harder. I will never forget 4 a.m. on D-Day when all the thousands of guns we had laboriously assembled opened fire at a precisely timed second. But the attack was doomed from the start. About the first half mile of enemy-held territory was lightly protected. But then came a most highly fortified line with enormously strong machine gun emplacement built on the surface. Well, before dawn began one of the worst rains I have ever known. For 11 days, almost ceaselessly. Norman Manley. Old Fritz in the meantime was getting his guns ready and suddenly opened on us with an infernal barrage not only of heavy and light artillery but also a terrible enfilade fire of machine guns, snipers and goodness knows what next. I got my men to advance in sectional rushes from shell hole to shell hole. Not a man faltered. I had to encourage no one and we continued to move forward smoking our cigarettes. At one time my gun section was reduced to three. Robert Canal. It is 1916. In countries around the world, the stark reality of war is sinking in. There are food and labor shortages and sudden spikes in the cost of living. Protests and riots inevitably erupt in Germany, England and Russia. On the battlefields, the bloodletting continues. The long, tragic Battle of Verdun in France begins on February the 21st, 1916. It lasts an unimaginable 10 months. German Chief of the General Staff Eric Falkenhayn seeks to bleed the French army to death by targeting the cherished French city of Verdun. The Battle of Verdun would be the longest single battle fought during the Great War, ending on December the 21st, 1916. Its ferocity is second only to the Battle of Somme. As soon as you talk of the sum, to lose 60,000 men in one day, to trying to advance, and ending up that day, back where you started, less 60,000 men in one day. 23rd On the 24th of June 1916, in an effort to divert German resources from Verdun, British and French forces begin a seven-day artillery bombardment of the German trenches near the Somme River. Assuming the German lines are destroyed, the Allies end their bombardment. But when the British troops start advancing, they discover the German front lines intact and the Germans ready to fight. This is a catastrophic disaster. The British suffer almost 60,000 casualties in one day, making it the bloodiest day in British military history. 
I was not there when they struck, but my brother Roy, then just 21 years old, was. It was just at dusk when they opened a terrific artillery fire on the wood. In five minutes, half our men were dead or wounded. Those who could ran to the spot. And among those missing was my brother, carrying on his back a man thought to be wounded. It turned out he was dead. And then Roy too fell, killed by a shell that burst a little distance off and sent a small fragment of its casing straight into his heart. I cannot speak of how I felt. We were very good friends, and I was to be lonely for the rest of the war. Lonely and bitter. Norman Manley. One of the rude shocks that people got from the beginning of this war, that it wasn't about hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was a mechanized war, and that made a huge difference. And then you had things like the Battle of the Somme, which went on for months and tens of thousands of young men died in the trenches and it was just appalling and horrible and nobody had experienced anything like that on the planet before. I mean, the scale of death and destruction, there were things like tanks and planes and mustard gas and machine guns and nobody had had any clue that this was what war had become. Although fear must have been a soldier's constant companion, there were some who reveled in the dangers of war. Then an aspiring novelist, Trinidadian Alfred Mendes, journeyed to England with the third merchant and planter's contingent. Upon arrival, he enlisted in the Rifle Brigade and was deployed to the Somme River in May of 1916. And sooner than we thought we were in it. Never shall I forget that long trudge along the shell-pocked road darkening with night. With drizzle falling we talked in hushed tones, intermittent salvos of shells hurtling down a little way off, their detonations hurting the eardrums. The area was alive with men to whom shouted orders were being directed. There was grumbling, there was muttering, there was confusion generated by the appalling return to the conditions, the ways and habits of primitive man. There were stretcher bearers with their heavy burdens wobbling in the mud and slime, uttering obscene words to the dreadful night sky. All of a piece with the language of the shells shrieking their swift and unerring flights through the night heavy with menace. And yet strange to tell, I sat there at the side of that road in a state of intense excitement and no fear at all. Time and again, this sense of elation in moments of danger was to return. Alfred Mendes. Trinidadian Stuart Scott was initially rejected by the army due to his poor eyesight, but his persistence was rewarded in 1915 when he was given a position in the Northumberland Fusiliers. Scott was injured near the German front along with most of his troop and he returned to Trinidad with both legs in a cast. But as soon as he was able to walk, he made his way back to England. He joined the Yorkshire Light Infantry and returned to active combat in 1917. But while white West Indian men continued to fight on the battlefields, the black men of the British West Indies Regiment languished. Initially, the 12 battalions of the BWIR were distributed between France, the Middle East and Africa. They were ammunition carriers, guards, clerks, carpenters and blacksmiths. They built railways and dug trenches. All were employed as labour units. You have 12 battalions, only two ever got a chance to fight. All the rest were just labour corps. Move that pile from there to there, move that pile from there to there. You know. So they were trained for combat. And let's make it clear that some of them did see combat, not in Europe, but in Egypt. Um, the battalions under Captain Cipriani, for example, saw combat. So some of them saw combat. Others were involved in duties which, although not considered direct combat, were obviously dangerous and important tasks. For example, carrying ammunition to soldiers at the front. They're doing this under shell fire. They're just as likely to be killed as the folks in the trenches. What the men 
did not like in general and Cipriani felt the same way. They felt they had gone to a war, they were away from their families and yet they, they weren't allowed to play the sort of active heroic parts they should play. One such soldier was Railway Douglas, the organizer of the first Calypso tent in Trinidad. Douglas served among the ranks in the British West Indies Regiment in Egypt, but was dissatisfied with his role as a laborer. What he said was, he was just there. What they had to do was to keep on training, practicing, and so on in the war, but um, they didn't have, have any combative role at all. That's what he told me. I learned that there was such inactivity among the recruits in the Middle East because I always thought of the men as, you know, heroic soldiers going fighting in the First World War. And um, they said, well, we wanted to fight, but, but we, we didn't fight. In late 1916, the 3rd and 4th Battalions of the British West Indies Regiment were deployed to the Western Front. There was discrimination on the fighting front. Uh, white soldiers did not want to fight alongside black soldiers. One. And so the blacks found themselves placed to do much of the menial work. And this was something that they had not bargained for and something they were not prepared to accept. And so uh, that left a bitter taste. Unfortunately, they came from the wrong part of the world and they were the wrong color. To add insult to injury, black soldiers were often met with appalling treatment from their white counterparts. In November 1917, an officer at the Marseille Stationary Hospital in France complained to his superiors about the addition of a black doctor to his ambulance staff. I wish to let you know, he wrote, that when we left Marseille on February 15th, Captain McDowell, RAMC, a West Indian Negro, was put on board by the Assistant Director of Medical Services for permanent duty. I greatly resent this and consider that an ambulance transport is not a suitable unit for him to belong to, where the limits of space are so circumscribed and where his presence on deck and in the dining saloon is greatly resented. Moreover, it is not at all pleasant for nursing sisters having to work with him in the wards. I should feel greatly indebted to you if you would kindly transfer this officer to another sphere of duty. In another ugly incident, a group of West Indian men marched into a British camp singing, Rule Britannia. They were confronted by white British soldiers who demanded to know, Who gave you niggers authority to sing that? Clear out of this building, only British soldiers admitted here. The soldiers who left were genuinely shocked at their treatment. They didn't expect that because they, they were so positive of their role as the defenders, you know, of, of, of the empire. This is what they were fighting for. So to be confronted by racism and non-acceptance, you know, at that level must have been very shocking to them. They expected to be treated as, as human beings, as equal human beings with everybody else. When they went there, however, they found there were high racial barriers as there had been in the Caribbean. And we, as Westerners, were all taught to look at Britain as the home of democracy, equality, freedom, all of that. So there was an enormous disappointment when they went to the mother country which they told Britain was, to see um, how that mother country was so discriminatory depending on, on your ethnic background. The living conditions of war were abhorrent. There were infestations of lice and mud and the stench of death were everywhere. The British West Indies soldiers worked through guard duties, trench life, inadequate food, illness and racism. Of the 12,000 men in the regiment, 1,071 would die from diseases. So the majority of the British you know, would die of berry berry and, and black water fever, things they'd never heard of. <laughs> the chaplain of the BWIR in France, Harry Brown, would write to the West Indian Contingent Committee back in Trinidad. I visited a barracks today and discovered German prisoners warm and comfortable, their rooms adequately heated by stoves. 
and in the same barracks our West India boys on the extreme top floor without any warming apparatus of any kind, cold and suffering. In every room where I saw West Indians there was at least one sick man and in one room two men were stretched on a concrete floor, both with high temperatures, huddled up, trying to secure as much warmth as possible from a couple of blankets. The officer who took me round described the room as the ghastliest and a perfect abomination. Pouring rain, quite tropical in its violence, and cold winds and mud, such mud as we never see in the West Indies except in hog pens became our portion. The mud was quite above our ankles and as we had only our thin uniforms, the inevitable result was cold influenza, pneumonia, fever, and ague. Our tents were far from new and I have vivid recollections of sleeping in liquid mud. A. E. Horner Although it was assumed that black soldiers would be able to adjust to the climate in the Middle East, illness was rampant and living conditions were repugnant. A Trinidadian soldier wrote home about the situation along the Suez Canal, where the British West Indies Regiment was stationed. I can hardly remember a worse camping ground than the desert environments of the canal, for not a tree could be seen, not even a shrub, only sand and sky, perhaps a stray camel or a poorly fed Arab. And in another account, Corporal Samuel Haynes described his experience in East Africa. Shipping difficulties would lead to the regiments being put on half rations, during which an officer's supply for 15 days were 15 pounds of rice, 8 ounces of sugar and 3 ounces of tea. Clothing was so scarce that when a man died, applications would be made for his boots and clothes. We arrived in the height of the winter season and were ushered into mud huts without any flooring. We had two blankets, one rubber sheet, and one crate coat in our possession. These huts were always leaking, and the roofs not being strong enough to stand the weather. The accommodation was rotten. It was strongly noticeable that in the huts in which British soldiers were quartered, electric lights, flooring, and winter stoves were introduced, but not in our camp, in my time. It is late 1916 in the Middle East. The Allies finally amass enough troops for an assault on the large Turkish forces in Palestine. Previous battles against the fortified Turk positions had failed, but the new forces comprised troops from Britain, India, Australia, New Zealand and the West Indies. The Palestine Theatre becomes the second largest after the Western Front in terms of forces deployed. It is here in the Middle East that the fate of the British West Indies Regiment changes. In November 1916, the decision is made to use the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the BWIR in combat. Here it was that we put paid to the Turks and gave the lie to our detractors who said that our men would not stand up under fire. The battalion, supported by the Auckland Rifles, went into action with the same calm as if they had been on ordinary parade. And in spite of being subjected to heavy fire, our troops never faltered for a single moment seemingly heedless of enemy fire. Arthur Andrew Cipriani was a fairly wealthy white Trinidadian of Corsican descent. When war broke out, he was a passionate recruiter of soldiers. He was over 40, so he was actually a little bit old, but he volunteered and was accepted and was, of course, commissioned as an officer. He ended the war with the rank of captain of one of the battalions of the British West India Regiment. In 1917, Cipriani joined the British West Indies Regiment in Egypt. He would participate in the British offensive against the Turks in Palestine. The West Indian troops were praised for their role in combat. 
Major General Sir E. W. C. Chaita wrote a message to them saying, Outside my own division there are no troops I would sooner have with me than the BWIs, who have won the highest opinion of all who have been with them during our operations here. The men worked exceedingly well, displaying the qualifications necessary for a machine gun section, viz a keen interest in their work, cheerfulness, coolness under fire, an intelligent application of what was required of them, and the necessary ability to carry it out under difficulties. Commanders also commented on the characteristic West Indian sense of humour. When the condition seemed most hopeless, they never seemed to give in, and the saving grace of humour seemed always to be present. On a patrol when everyone had to sleep in pouring rain, when too tired to march any further, the only comment was, Serve me right for my fastness to join the contingent. When I get home, I will be afraid even to join a church. Nineteen seventeen is the pivotal point in the Great War. German U boats dominate the seas, attacking both military and merchant vessels. Germany's submarine warfare tactics prompt the United States of America to abandon its neutrality and isolation. In early January, Congress authorizes a declaration of war against Germany, and the US enters the war on the side of the Allies. A growing tide of nationalism sweeps across Europe. Widespread sickness, death and food shortages erode public faith in the war. The Russian Revolution begins in March, dismantling the 300-year-old Tsarist autocracy. The communist leader Lenin comes to power in October 1917 and promptly pulls Russia out of the war. With Russia gone, Germany can focus more resources on the Western Front. In France, a mutinous atmosphere engulfs the French army. Soldiers refuse orders to advance on May the 27th. The arrival of American troops in late June manages to rally the fractured Allied forces. Meanwhile, the Turks are failing in Egypt and British troops are pushing toward Gaza. In 1918, tensions explode as the Allied naval blockade of German ports leads to widespread food shortages. In Berlin, starving masses take to the streets to protest the war. At the same time, Germany focuses all her military resources on a foolhardy attempt to invade Paris. German General Ludendorff pushes his army relentlessly towards the French capital in a desperate gamble. In three months, the German troops gain more ground than they had in the previous three years, but the pace proves too much for them. Overcome with exhaustion and facing Allied reinforcements, Ludendorff's army is forced to retreat, having reached within 80 kilometers of Paris. German morale wanes along the Western Front as the Allies bombard the retreating German army. By September 1918, Allied forces break through Germany's main fortified front at the Hindenburg Line during the Fourth Battle of Ypres signaling the loss of the Western Front for Germany. It is the beginning of the end for the Central Powers in the First World War. Turkey pulls out of the Middle East at the end of October and Austria-Hungary signs an armistice with the Allies in November. Prompted by the collapse of the Central Powers, Germany finally accepts that the war is lost and signs an armistice in France, which takes effect at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918. It is a fateful ending to one of the worst wars in modern history. After four years of relentless fighting, the death toll is estimated at 65 million souls. Even so, the end of the war brings jubilation in the streets everywhere. 
but not everyone shares in the unbridled happiness. Standing in Hyde Park in London, Norman Manley is pensive. It was over, but I could get no sense of joy. Over a million families face the future without the stimulus of an unfinished war. And with the intuition that the future would engage everybody's mind and less and less would the sacrifice of the past be remembered. The things that were behind would soon be forgot. I remembered my fallen friends, but the number was so great that each loss was reduced by some strange rule of feeling. I thought of the future of mankind, but it did not seem that the spirit that had fused hot in unity with the slogans about the war to end war and make the world safe for democracy was going to survive the passions and hazards of peace. Manley's sentiments reflect the feeling of many of the returning soldiers of the British West Indies Regiment. They had survived the war to end all wars, but what now? Demobbing the BWIR would take months. Eight battalions of the regiment arrive in Toronto, Italy for demobilization but their superior officers demand that the men work as dock workers and labourers, building toilets for white soldiers also stationed in Toronto. These were men who were stationed in Toronto and were humiliated by being forced to do very demeaning duties. Remember, these were volunteer soldiers, proud men, and they were being forced to clean latrines and clean up after the white troops and this kind of thing. Meanwhile, white soldiers of the British Army receive a pay increase, but black soldiers do not. Angry and humiliated, the 9th Battalion of the British West Indies Regiment is at its breaking point. Years of pent up rage finally explode on the 9th of December 1918 when Lieutenant Colonel Willis orders the men to clean the latrines of the Italian Labour Corps. They refused to obey orders. I think there was a black NCO who shot somebody. Um, he would probably have been the one who ended up dead, but his, his companions joined in as well. So it became a full-scale mutiny and there were court-martials and so on and so on. The men revolt against their senior officers and in the free, a black non-commissioned officer shoots a mutineer in self-defense. A machine gun company and a battalion are dispatched to restore order. The 9th Battalion is disbanded and 60 men court-martialed. Sentences range from 5 to 20 years. One soldier is put to death by firing squad. Exhausted and bitter, the British West Indies Regiment sails home with a new resolve. Lads of the West, with duty done, soon we shall be parted to a different land, perhaps no more each other's face to see, but still as comrades of the war our efforts will unite to sweep injustice from our land, its social wrongs to right.